Mark 1, 4. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. We relight the first candle as a symbol of Christ our hope. We light a second candle as a symbol of Christ the way. May the word sent from God through the prophets lead us to the way of salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel. people to deliver on 
a child and yet a king, born to reign in us forever. Now thy gracious kingdom bring, by thy own eternal spirit, rule in all our hearts alone. By thine all-sufficient merit, raise us to thy glorious throne. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to thank you for joining us this morning for this time of worship. I want to share with you that we have decided to call this The Gathering simply because it's a way of reaching out to people who want to be United Methodists, whose churches have disaffiliated, and we're trying to gather you together for worship and hopefully in time for some other possibilities, maybe Bible studies or other ministries or ways that we can stream um, information or experiences or groups, a group experience uh, to, to you. And so I want to thank you for for joining us this morning. We are called the Gathering United Methodist Church. And of course, as we gather this morning, there are many things on our hearts and on our minds. I know that this is an incredibly um, difficult and um, uncertain time of transition for, for those of you who are in this situation, but we want you to connect with, with this community. We want you to connect with other communities that, that you have locally. Uh, whether you've decided to go and be a part of another United Methodist Church or you are in a, with a group of people of uh, three or four or maybe 15 or 20 or, or more than that. So when we gather, we know that just like on Sunday morning in all of our congregations around the state, we have persons on our minds and that we the church, as we come together, we can have a time of prayer for those, for those persons. Uh, last week we asked you to, to share names um, and between that and a couple of other opportunities, I have three names of persons that I would like to share with, with you for us to, to lift up for prayer this morning. And the first person is Martha Roberson, um, who is undergoing some tests and then James and Shirley Farmer, who are also undergoing some tests. And so as we pause for a time of prayer, I want to invite you to be thinking about these persons and lifting them up in prayer. And I'll have some instructions for how we will continue to, to do that as we, as we go. But let's just take a moment right now and be together in spirit in, in prayer. Would you pray with me? Oh God, we thank you for this day that you have given to us. It is a day of worship, a day to come and to gather and to um, quiet ourselves and to sit at the, the feet of, of Christ, to hear the word of God, to allow it to um, soak into us, to teach us, to challenge us, to encourage us and to give us strength for the journey that we make with Christ. Oh God, I, I pray for um, everyone who is in this time of, of transition. I pray that those who have decided to stay United Methodist but will no longer be meeting with, with their congregations because they have disaffiliated, that you would, Lord, come alongside of them and remind them of a couple of things. First of all, that they belong to you. First and foremost, your scriptures teach us that we were created in your image and that when you created us, you looked at it and called it good. And then, Lord, I pray that we will also realize that just as God gave the, those first humans that, that were in the garden um, instructions and, and called them um, to, to, to be good stewards of all that God had given to them. So also, Lord, you have given us a purpose for our lives. 
and that we can continue to live out that purpose um, through our conference, through uh, our local situation and whatever ministry and ways that we, we find. And God, I just ask God that you would help us to never forget that we belong to you and that there's an important purpose for our lives and that you are counting on us, God, to continue to be a part of the furthering of, of your kingdom in our, in our world. I thank you for those who, who gather this day. I pray, Lord, that as they grieve that you will come and comfort them and that you will help them to know that you are trying to begin something new in their lives. That just as this child is born into a, a world that uh, was very oppressive and, and a world that was struggling and a world that had forgot about God and God's purposes, so also in the midst of their struggle, in the midst of their grief, they too might find that Christ can be born anew again in their lives that there are many different ways that you can continue to work in their life. And so I pray now, God, that you would just draw near to them as they draw near to you. Today there are three persons on our hearts and minds that we want to lift up to you. We want to pray for Martha Roberson and then for James and Shirley Farmer as they go through tests. I pray, God, that you would watch over them Help them to know that you are by their side and that they can lean upon you for strength. I pray that these tests will help the doctors and nurses who care for them to, to bring them healing. And I pray, Lord, that they would experience your healing not only in body, but also in spirit. I thank you for their lives and for their journey of faith. And I just pray, uh, God, that these things will be the beginning of the, the, the healing that they need in their, their lives. And all these things we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson for today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3. I'm going to begin with verse 1 and read through verse 12. And as always, I invite you to listen for God's word. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the desert of Judea, announcing, Change your hearts and lives. Here comes the kingdom of heaven. He was the one of whom Isaiah the prophet spoke when he said, The voice of one shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight. John wore clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. People from Jerusalem throughout Judea and all around the Jordan River came to him. As they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. Many Pharisees and Sadducees came to be baptized by John. He said to them, You children of snakes, who warned you to escape from the angry judgment that is coming soon? Produce fruit that shows you have changed your hearts and lives. And don't even think about saying to yourselves, Abraham is our father. I tell you that God is able to raise up Abraham's children from these stones. The axe is already at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be chopped down and tossed into the fire. I baptize with water those of you who have changed your hearts and lives. The one who is coming after me is stronger than I am. I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The shovel he uses to sift the wheat from the husks is in his hands. He will clean out his threshing area and bring the wheat into his barn. But he will burn the husks with a fire that can't be put out. And may the Lord bless this, God's holy word. Would you pray with me? O oh God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as this scripture has been read, and we hear your word, we may hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Amen. Anytime we make a new beginning, there are always things that have to come to an end. 
Uh, I remember when I graduated from high school and decided to go on to college. I was taking a full load in college. I was working 20 hours a week. But one of the things that changed was is that my parents were no longer there to tell me when I needed to, to study or how I needed to budget my time or how I needed to budget my money. When I got married, I will never forget how it didn't take me long at all to realize that the decisions that I made didn't just affect me. What's mine becomes ours, and what affects one person affects the other person. Well, that's also true of having a baby. When you have a baby, you um, stop having nothing in your hands. You stop having the freedom of just picking up and going anywhere whenever you want to. And when you do decide that you're going to go somewhere, you usually take like a whole carload full of stuff. Dana and I used to go to movies all the time before children. Um, we used to go to a movie like just almost every single week. Well, when you have a baby, you start renting movies. We used to go shopping. We used to just, you know, run around the, the city and do all different kinds of things like that. When you have a baby, you stay at home a lot and you kind of stop shopping. You start trying to save more money and sometimes you even begin to, 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 to worry about money. You remember me telling you that when Dana and I um, were getting ready to have our oldest child, Kate, that we decided that we needed to have a nursery. And one of the first things that we had to do was um, change that room altogether. So that meant that we had to clean out all the stuff that had, had, get, had collected in that, in that room. We also had to literally clean the room, the room up. And in our scripture lesson for today, what we learn here is that in order for the Messiah to come, some things have to come to an end. You remember me telling you last week that this is a time which we call Advent, a time of preparing for Christ to come in our lives, but it is not a time where we do absolutely nothing. And this is the reason why John the Baptist says, repent for the kingdom of God has come near. Now, at first look, it would almost seem like uh, John is like from a whole nother planet. I mean, he wears uh, camel's hair and his food is locusts and wild honey. But there's something that I really learned that was important about this scripture. If you read the scripture and you hear John quoting from Isaiah, you realize that there is a voice that is out in the wilderness. Well, what we need to remember about John is that John is also out in the wilderness. He is wearing the, the, the clothing of somebody who finds themselves in want. And what's so important about this is, number one, um, Isaiah was speaking to a group of people who were in exile. They were in a wilderness of sort. Um, by being in exile, that meant they were in a whole other country with people of another culture and a religion. They were not in a place where they had a temple, where they had rabbis that could teach them, where they could have their way of life. But both Isaiah and John are trying to get us to recall the 40-year trek across the wilderness which the Hebrews made when they were freed from slavery because it was there that they made mistakes. It was there that, that, their, that, that their trust of God was tested. It was there that they learned how to trust in God. It was there that they grew in their faith so that finally when they, they came to the, to the point of being able to inherit the promised land, they had a different relationship with God. They had changed. They were ready for that new thing to happen in their life. So what John is doing in our scripture lesson for today is putting himself in a place of want. Now, um, a lot of times when we find ourselves in a place of want, the, most, the first thing that we think of is we want to be rescued by somebody. John says, I'm not interested in your rescue, I'm interested in your redemption. 
And this is what he says about that. He says, the one who is coming is going to baptize you with fire. And he sort of uses this harvest image of, of separating the chaff from the wheat and taking the chaff and burning it up. And there are many times that, that we focus on burning that up, thinking about burning up our, our sins. And, and that's probably a good way to, to think about that. But it's also important to remember that the whole purpose is to save the, the wheat so that by redemption, what is meant here is that what God is trying to do is to not just have us be in a right relationship with him, but to be the kind of people that he wants us to be. You know, I know some Christians who like to talk about their faith like this. They say, you know, I'm going to get God into my life or I'm going to renew my faith in God so that I can get control of my life. What I've discovered about faith is, is that we need to learn how to trust God. We need to get God into our life so that God can get control of us. You see, salvation doesn't just have to do with um, accepting Christ into your heart and, and being saved. John Wesley used to say there's another part to that. There's justification, but then there's also sanctification. That is, God continues to work on us, to mold us, to, to, to shape us, to teach us and to show us the kind of person that God wants us to be so that we can be his disciples creating the kind of world that we are called to have. A world that would bring us peace, a world that would bring us hope, and a life that would bring us joy. And help us to live life the way God intended for us to live that life. Now, folks, we've been talking about being isolated. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever felt like you didn't belong? Maybe you were in a group of people and you didn't share the same values with them. Perhaps maybe you might have been in a group of people and you just said, I just don't look at things the same way that these people look at. And so maybe I don't feel like I belong. Well, recently we had 29 churches disaffiliate from our conference. We lost some very dear brothers and sisters. But in the process, we discovered that there were some who said in those congregations, I still want to be United Methodist. And yet, because those churches decided to go a new direction, because they had um, the vote and the support of the people, those who wanted to become United Methodists kind of became alienated. And they came to feel, you have come to feel, some of you, like you just don't belong. And you know what the problem is? I mean, it's one thing when... Um, you know, people, when you don't feel like you belong somewhere, maybe you want to go and try something else out. But it's another thing when someone sort of communicates that to you. And the reason is, is because when that becomes connected with our faith, um, we begin to believe that the things that we learned in Genesis 1, which told us that God created us and that God created something very good, and that we have a purpose in life, that God has many important plans and things for us to, to experience, all of a sudden we begin to call that into question when we don't feel like we belong anymore. We say to ourselves, you know, am I really a worthwhile person? Maybe there's not an important part for my, my life. And folks, in the midst of all of that, God is, is calling us to bring an end to something. And what the end, I think, is, is that we need to be reminded that God still loves us, that God created us and called it good, that God has a purpose for our life and that just because circumstances or because maybe someone has inferred or implied or even just told us outright we don't belong does not mean we don't belong to God and that we don't have a part and a purpose in God's kingdom. We need to bring an end to 
having those negative thoughts about ourselves or accepting those negative thoughts inside of, of, of us. And instead of maybe delivering us, God wants to redeem us. God wants to show us that in the midst of our alienation, in the midst of our isolation, that that's precisely where the light shines through. Darkness is where the light shines through. Isolation is where the light shines through. When you've been told that you don't belong, when it seems to be implied that somehow you don't belong, that's the moment where the light shines through. And God tells us, I love you. You are a child of God, and I want to make a new beginning with you. Maybe that new beginning is you going and being a part of another United Methodist congregation. Maybe it is to get together with your brothers and sisters and to have a, a fellowship, whether it's five or 10 or 20 or 30, or maybe even more. God is not finished with you yet. God still wants to do many wonderful things in your life. And one of those things that God wants to do more than any other and the other thing is to, not, is, is to get you to come to a point where, where other people, where, where their determinations or their judgments don't have control over you. They don't have the final word. You know, I feel sorry for some people um, who um, never have experiences in life because it means they're going to have to risk themselves. It means they're going to have to grow again. It means they're going to have to trust in God. I will never forget when Dana and I were getting ready to have our oldest child, Kate. One day we were talking with this couple, and this couple was being so negative. And, and, and basically they were telling us, you know, your life is going to come to an end as you know it. It's, you know, none, none of it is going to be about you anymore. It's only going to be about that child. You're going to find yourself drained. You're going to find yourself tired. Um, you're going to find life difficult. There's so many things that you're going to have to sacrifice. And you know what I discovered? I discovered that they were half right. Yes, our lives did change. Yes, there were times that it was difficult to have a child. Uh, yes, it was very challenging. Yes, there were days that we did not know what to do next. Um, you know, all the things that your parents used to say to you all of a sudden began to make sense, uh, especially the one about nobody, you know, ever handed you instructions about exactly how you were supposed to raise this child, how to be the best father or mother that you could be. But then there was another side. And it was those very precious moments when you saw your child grow, when you saw your child learn something, when you saw them begin to improve and, and, and get better, when you saw gifts that God had given to them and those gifts begin to come out in them. And then there was this incredible joy when you saw something click inside of their heads that you'd been trying to talk to them about for a long time, when they had made a breakthrough of one kind or another. Folks, God has called us to risk ourselves. And it's, it's a risk that we have to take when we've been hurt and we've been told we don't belong. We have to find our way and we have to find that new sense of belonging. But I believe God can do that. But we have to trust Him. We have to put an end sometimes to our negative way of thinking or only thinking negatively when things happen to us. We have to continue to, to focus on what is God trying to teach me in this situation? What is God trying to show me? Because once again, darkness is where the light shines through. It is in the midst of gloom and doom. Uh, the world in which Christ came into was a world of oppression. People had forgotten about who they were and whose they were. 
And it was this child that was going to help them redefine that one more time. He was going to show them a way of life that God had called them to, a way that was the way life intended to be. Terry Helwick talks about reaching age 41. She says, I married early, I had my children early, so one day I decided to go back um, to school and to become a counselor. And she said it was like starting all over again. There were things that I had to set aside. There were new adventures that I had to take. There were risks that were involved. And she says, one day I was at the beach, and she said, I just was just taking it easy that day. And she said, I waded out into the waters just to, to feel the coolness of the, of the waters and, and all of my environment that was going on around me. And she said, all of a sudden, I felt something underneath my foot. And, and when I looked, looked down, it was, a, it was a shell. And just then, I saw something move. She said, at first, I kind of jumped. I was a little bit alarmed. But then I realized it was only a hermit crab. She said, I read something about hermit crabs. They don't make their own homes, but instead they inhabit the homes of uh, other animals. However, they get bigger, and so they have to find a, a bigger shell. Um, and then they get bigger, and so they have to find another shell, and so on and, and so forth. And that night, she said, I prayed, God, help me to know when it's time to grow again. Would you pray with me? Oh God, you have asked us to make a new beginning with you. But Lord, we know that it involves risks. We know that it involves venturing out into the unknown. We know that it makes us vulnerable. Help us, Lord, to place our trust in you. Help us, Lord, to be ready to learn and to grow and to find new life. Amen. I want to invite you this morning to take time to um, uh, think about where you need to grow and what things need to come to an end in your life. Maybe in order for God to start something new in you, maybe you might need to uh, be a little less self-centered. Um, maybe to be a little bit less in control. Maybe to say, God, I will trust you more even when I find myself in the unknown, in the uncertainties of life. I want to invite you to think about what that thing is, and I want you to just take a moment and just sort of just silently pray, God, forgive me for doing these things. Help me, Lord, to be able to set them aside that you might give birth to something new in my life. And then I want you to continue to watch and to wait for God to show up and for God to begin something new. Amen. What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch our keeping? This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds God and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. So bring him in. Gold and myrrh, 
Come peasant king to own him, the king of kings salvation brings. Let loving hearts enthrone him. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds God and Babe, the son of Mary. Christ the King, whom shepherds God and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it was good to be with you again on this second Sunday of Advent. We hope and pray that as we have gone through this service, singing our praises to God, offering our prayers, hearing the, the scriptures and the word proclaimed, that God has encouraged us yet once more in our journey. I want to share with you um, a few announcements. First of all, I want to invite you to uh, register your attendance. If you'll just take your cell phone and turn it to camera mode, there is a QR code in the bottom right hand corner. You can hold the phone right up to that and that will automatically take you to a page where you can register, you can put your name, you can put some contact information. Um, there is also um, a, a box that you can check to say, uh, I would like to try to find some opportunities to serve. We know that many of you are still continuing to do ministry with others that want to stay United Methodist right in your own communities, and we, we are thrilled about that. But if you would like to try to find some ways to serve with uh, some of the conference ministries that, that we're doing, um, things not just right here in Oklahoma City, but, but all around the, the, the state, you may check that box and we'll try to contact you as soon as possible about some ways that you might be able to serve. Um, and then um, there will also be a couple of boxes that have to deal with prayer concerns. When we have our time of pastoral prayer, we want to be able to name persons. Um, but, but we want to do a couple of things here. First of all, um, when we name those persons, we want you to check with that person to make sure that it's okay because we will be naming them on this live stream. And... Um, and then if there is someone that you want to pray for, but perhaps maybe they would rather not be mentioned, what we will say um, at, the, at the end is we have some unspoken requests that, that we want to pray for. And they can be a part of, um, can be included in that, in that prayer time um, as well. Uh, as I said before, uh, we have just begun this ministry brand new. We're trying to find ways as United Methodists, you know, serve God with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service. And we want to give you opportunities to be able to give. Uh, we know that December is a time when many of our ministries are trying to catch up and meet ends, and that takes money. And, and, and where that money comes from is from, from all of us supporting um, those those ministries. If you would like to to give a gift to to a particular ministry that we are talking about or sharing about, um, we will uh, try to let you know about that um, as soon as we as we possibly can. We also want to encourage you to continue to support the things that you support locally, both with your giving and with your service. 
Uh, I'm excited about something we're doing next week. And so I, so I want to tell you that next week, the message part, the scripture and the message part of our service is going to be done from two different places. One is Rio Bravo, Mexico uh, at Hands Together Ministry and all the things that they're doing. And the other part is going to be at Lydia Patterson in El Paso. Once again, we're going to talk about uh, what, it, what it means to belong. Only it's going to be a little bit different emphasis where today we talked about, you know, people um, belonging and, and knowing that, that, that God uh, created us and called it good and has a purpose for our, our lives individually. We're going to talk about what it means to belong as the church that crosses boundaries. And I'm excited to, to be able to tell you that one of the people that's going to be a part of this is going to be our, our bishop. So our message may be kind of more of an interview uh, kind of a message, but our bishop is going to have some very important things to, to share with us, and, uh, and I hope you will join us for that next Sunday morning at uh, 10 o'clock or um, sometime um, just not too long, too long after that, and, uh, and just, just worship with us as we, uh, as we talk about our mission and ministry that reaches out to people across boundaries. Uh, once again, thank you for joining us this day. And um, I would ask you now to, to uh, pray with me as I, as I send you forth with a benediction. Oh God, I thank you for this day and for this time of worship. God, send us forth that even though we have felt isolated at times, even though we have felt that we did not belong, we are convinced in our hearts by the, by the scriptures that teach us that you created us and you created us for a particular purpose. Help us, Lord, to trust in you. Help us, Lord, to seek your guidance in showing us the, the way that we can carry out that purpose. Uh, help us, God, to be encouraged by, by your word and help us to know, Lord, that you can continue to use us to be in mission and ministry and to find the, the, the joy that comes with living life as you intended for it to be. Lord, let us go forth this day. And let us go forth with, with faith and with your presence guiding us and, and leading us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.